equine veterinarian, an equine enthusiast, and uh, by training an internal medicine specialist, but got very intrigued by muscle disorders in horses early on in my career and established a neuromuscular diagnostic lab. And horses are athletes, and so we're very interested in their muscle from an athletic perspective. So a lot of the workup that we do in these horses is related to muscle metabolism, and um, our neuromuscular lab obtains frozen sections and for each muscle biopsy that we get, we usually do at least six or seven stains that would, in a similar fashion to human laboratories, look at um, muscle diseases. And a lot of the genetic focus we've had has originally been on metabolic causes of muscle disorders in horses. So I've discovered through recent research that pigs are also athletes. And, uh, but I'm only going to present to you this from the perspective of how we investigate genetic disorders in large animals. Um, and it won't uh, necessarily pertain um, to pigs. Pigs, of course, being production animals, and a lot of the genetics um, in a very sophisticated way has been done in pigs with uh, production animal traits, looking at multiple genes and how they contribute to meat quality or how they contribute uh, to growth characteristics. What we've been focusing on in our studies is individual animal medicine and trying to understand when you've got a disease, what's the basis for that specific disease. And then in, in uh, several cases, it ends up being a genetic basis for that disease. And we're looking for a Mendelian trait, meaning we're looking for one specific gene defect that's going to be uh, inherited as a, a recessive or a dominant or an X-linked uh, disorder. So just a, um, this is all going to be a very basic talk. I don't do the statistical genetics in our group. I do the clinical phenotyping and then move on from there. And so all we're concentrating on in this particular aspect then uh, in simple genetic disorders is a genetic mutation in the coding sequence that's going to change the amino acid sequence. And in the amino acid sequence change, it's going to change the function of a protein. And we're going to see a phenotype or clinical characteristics that are directly related to the fact that you've got a protein whose function is then altered. So it may be tempting to think of the genetic code as uh, being coding sequences for protein, and that's all the genetic code um, is made up of. Um, but in fact, there are numerous huge areas of the genome that are not uh, coding sequences. Some of those are related to introns. So for any given gene uh, area, in the DNA, there are areas called exons that are protein coding. They'll code for an amino acid. There will be an, uh, an intron that's not related to protein coding. And for one particular sequence, you'll have all of these exons. Some genes are huge. Uh, some genes are very small. They may have three introns. They may have hundreds, sorry, three exons or hundreds of exons. If you chop away all of this unrelated material, make mRNA, have your protein sequence, and all is good. So in a simple case of uh, genetic disease, all we're really looking for is to see if we've got a change in the genetic sequence within those exons, and that change relates to a protein um, that we can link to the disease. It's never really that simple, but that's usually where we start. So the simplest approach, uh, an approach we took for muscle disease in Charolais cattle many years ago now, is where you think you know this is what the gene is. Uh, the campus syndrome that was presented, for example, you have a candidate, there's a disease that seems to be very similar in other species, and you've got a gene and you just say, well, I think that's what it is, and you go ahead um, and sequence that gene. And the one thing that we learned from this investigation is how um, you can have a pretty high frequency of carriers of a genetic disease in a population and yet really not know anything about it. So this young calf presented as a case of white muscle disease. When they would move the herd of Charolais cows and calves from one pasture to another, it was quite a hilly pasture. Usually every spring when they did that, they would get a few stragglers that would go down, have really high muscle enzymes, and assumed um, that they had um, white muscle disease. They had elevations in CK and AST. They had severe muscle necrosis in the ones that did not survive. And so when I was um, evaluating these animals in the clinic, I said, you know, what are the selenium and vitamin E concentrations? And they said they're normal. And I asked, well, then how can this be white muscle disease? And they said, well, it's just atypical. Um, so we ran routinely muscle samples through the lab. 
we did routine sections for the human uh, laboratories, so we just did that section with all of the stains we did and immediately came up with the fact that it had excessive amounts of glycogen in the tissues and that it didn't stain for the enzyme myophosphorylase, which is the most common enzyme deficiency in humans that causes a glycogen storage disease. Confirmed the lack of that enzyme um, biochemically and the increase in muscle glycogen concentrations biochemically, and that gave us a really nice candidate gene in this case. So uh, working with other colleagues, we sequenced that particular gene, and we found a genetic mutation. The question that arises, is this the only animal in the herd that has this particular problem? And so we needed to develop a clinical screening test to see whether it looked like there might be other affected calves. We came up with a, a novel situation in which we took uh, veterinary students and put them in large pastures with these cows and just chased them all around. Veterinary students are, is it running? Okay. So we chased them all around and we looked for the stragglers. And when the calves stopped and lay down and couldn't keep up with their mothers, we tested those particular uh, cows for AST and CK. And then uh, we found that there were at least nine other calves that he didn't realize were affected in, the, in that particular group. And subsequently, when we went through and looked at pedigrees, the nine particular individuals all seemed to be related several generations back. And then um, we were able to develop uh, a genetic test, which was a single base pair that was missing. It changed the amino acid sequence, and then it seemed to change the function of that myophosphorylase. They could no longer burn glycogen as fuel. They were running out of energy when they exercised, and they developed muscle necrosis. The surprising thing to this owner was um, that 21% of his herd were carriers. And he shut us down. When we came up with this, no talking about this disease, no talking to the Charlotte Breeders Association, uh, didn't want any of this information to get out. But interestingly enough, uh, about 10 years later, we did publish this uh, in scientific journals, and they identified it in New Zealand, they've identified it in Europe, identified it in many other places. So you can get some of these things that sneak into your herd. The odd individual uh, gets noticed, but you don't really uh, pick up on it until you do genetic testing. So this is a, an easy one in that there was a human disease that looks exactly like what we were seeing in cattle. And that can be incredibly deceptive. And, uh, one of the reasons it's easier in animals than it is in humans is because we have a founder effect. There's usually one particular individual in this case, it was an offspring of a bull that had been uh, imported from France. He had been tested heavily in uh, Texas, and his offspring were all fine. It was uh, potentially then his son that got introduced as the founder to this herd, bred to a cow that had this mutation, and then that started the problem within the herd itself. So they all end up having the same genetic mutation. In humans, we don't have the same prolific uh, impact of thousands and thousands of offspring so you see many different genetic mutations, not often the same genetic mutation in humans. So when you run into situations where that's not possible, you have no idea what the potential gene might be, or there's just too many of them to sequence, one of the approaches you can take is a genome mapping approach. And a genome mapping approach relies on having genetic markers, usually taking advantage of the fact that there are coding and non-coding regions, so it just has to be a variant that is um, present in one individual, not present in in another individual, and it resides in a specific site that you can identify on a chromosome. So you have genetic maps for each individual species that have de been developed, and you can use that genetic map with the variants that are on that map to try to localize um, a legion, a region. So there are all kinds of different genetic markers. For the most part now, the markers that are used are single nucleotide polymorphisms. So I might have a C at once specific spot. You might have a T. It might not code for anything. It might not mean anything that we understand. There are just these variants um, that exist in different individuals. And when you put all of those variants together, the ones that you test, you end up coming up with um, a genotype. And what you're looking for when you use a genome-wide association study is not that mutation. You're looking for the markers that always seem to follow with that mutation. And you're hoping that your map is dense enough that you have markers that are going to be located quite close to where the genetic mutation sits somewhere on a chromosome. 
um, somewhere in an individual, and you're following to see that they're linked to the, to the phenotype. And the emphasis I want to put on this is it's extraordinarily important when you do these things that your phenotype is really well defined. Genetics is not magic, and it's crap in, crap out. Uh, if you don't have a really clearly defined group of individuals, you know how well related they are, and you know exactly what the specific diagnostic criteria you have for that. You can include so many different diseases together within that that you have no power to detect what, what you're looking for. And my example of that is uh, this approach we used when we were looking at tying up. Uh, when I learned about tying up in veterinary school, there was only one thing, and that was tying up was one disease, and we've subsequently discovered that there are many, many different causes of horses to have exertional rhabdomyolysis. And we were focusing on quarter horses and noticing that there were relationships among quarter horses that had this particular condition. They had common clinical signs, but the defining feature we found in our muscle biopsies was the fact that not only do they have too much glycogen, but they have a very abnormal glycogen and it was resistant to amylase digestion. Should not see that in skeletal muscle. And the great thing about this was it gave us a phenotype that was clear. They have to have 1.5 times more glycogen in their muscle than a normal horse. They have to absolutely have this type of abnormal polysaccharide. And then our controls had to be exactly the opposite. We didn't just take a horse that somebody said is normal. I've learned that that is absolutely the wrong thing to do. We have to have the same criteria evaluated, and we pick extremes when we do this genome mapping. As far to the left abnormal as you can pick, as many of those individuals, and as far to the right in terms of normal. And again, we balance them so we know how related they are, or you have to statistically account for the fact that one group is more related than another um, population stratification during the genetic analysis, during the statistical analyses. And then from my point of view, it's just magic happens. You just take the samples and isolate the DNA and send it away, and you get results back. Um, but it involves a gene chip or a SNP chip, and they have varying densities of markers depending on how well your species is characterized. We've had, starting off, only 54,000 markers in horses. Then we improved to 75,000 markers. Now we're up to a million. But that's nothing compared to what's available um, in human medicine. But they can um, look at those one million individual variants, call them, and give you a genotype for each individual. And then um, more magic happens with the statistical geneticists. They analyze all of that data to look to see if there are a bunch of markers of one type that are specifically associated with your phenotype. And that comes back as what's called a Manhattan plot, because it looks like the skyline of Manhattan. And what you're hoping for is that there are a group of markers closely located to your disease that are come back, going to come back as highly significantly associated with the disease. So this gives you the p-value for how statistically significant they are, and then you're hoping that you're going to have a whole bunch of uh, high-rises on one specific chromosome that are going to be genome-wide significant in their association with the disease. I have been involved in many of these, and most of them have come back with nothing. Um, but we've had some success, particularly with this polysaccharide storage myopathy that I described. And now that the horse's genome is sequenced, you can actually just sit at your uh, computer. You can pull up that region of the genome that's associated with it. You can look at the whole genome sequence, the reference sequence for the horse. And we just looked in that one particular area where we had markers that were highly associated with it. And then you say, well, what genes are there? And you go through the list of genes, and we found, whoa, glycogen synthase is there, the gene that um, is responsible for synthesizing glycogen. And it turned out when we sequenced that gene, we had single mutation. That mutation uh, increased the activity of glycogen synthase. So we had a mutation. We, we showed that it had a function. And then we looked at um, the change in amino acid sequence that occurred with the single mutation, we had a histidine for an arginine, and it was in a very, very highly conserved region. So we have to put all of those pieces of the puzzle together to prove to people that this is a mutation that not only is associated with it, but it has a change of, of function. So all of those things have to go together uh, in order to be able to map it, and then you end up with a candidate gene from your mapping. You sequence the candidate gene and see what you can find. 
So I just want to go back again. If we had not defined a family, if we had not defined clear phenotypic parameters of glycogen and abnormal polysaccharide, we would not have come up with this mutation. We've tried genome-wide association studies in thoroughbreds that tie up, but our phenotype is based on the, the trainer saying, yep, tied up. Sometimes I can get CK out of them, can't get a muscle biopsy. I just don't feel like in those studies we're able to clearly enough to find the phenotype that this approach has, has worked, even when we've included hundreds and hundreds of horses. And then the last thing that's now currently become available to us, which is sort of mind-boggling when you started with how hard it was to do genetics when we didn't even have any markers um, for horses to begin with and just candidate genes, and we were basing all of our um, probes on the human sequence, is it's now cost, we sequenced the equine genome about four or five years ago for millions and millions of dollars. Now you can sequence a genome for 2450 bucks. Um, and so the temptation is to say, well, why do all of this investigation? Let's just sequence the genome of that affected horse, and we'll do four of those and four of these and look at that and just see what, what gene is different. Well, when you do that, you find there are 13.3 million variants uh, in horses. We all individually differ from one another here, there, and everywhere. And there are 2.5% of those are in the coding regions of the exons. So that gives you about... 332,000 variants that you have to sift through and try to figure out whether any of those make sense or not, if they're consistently present. So if you're going to do this approach, you still need to have a pretty firm set of candidate genes that you're interested in and that you um, want to look at. And even if you do find a mutation, then someone's really got to have defined the pathophysiology of that disease so you know, I'm interested in glycogen or I'm interested in a demyelinating disorder or I'm interested in a structural disorder, because the genes have to make sense, and you have to then show that that mutation eventually changes a function that would make sense with your particular disease. And then the other thing about whole genome sequencing, which I am learning, is that um, it drives the people that are doing that data analysis insane. There are terabytes and terabytes of data. We have 20 terabytes of data right now that you need to sift through. So it's amazing amount of data, amazing degree of complexity, and it looks like many of the genetic disorders we're dealing with are not because of coding sequence defects. They are in the regulatory regions of genes. They ch change which genes are turned on and which genes are turned off um, at, at particular times, and so there are some exciting things to come out of this, but it, it can also be quite complex. So the great thing if you're doing an investigation and there's any hint that you've got a genetic disease is to have fresh frozen tissue from those individuals or buffy coat from those individuals because that gives you the DNA that you can go back and look at at any time. And so for our muscle biopsies that are submitted frozen, we have uh, 5,000 samples that are there, and when we see disease patterns, we're able to isolate DNA from those, those samples um, and look at them. So uh, looking at pedigrees, looking at the degree of relatedness amongst individuals, having the DNA samples available, having them very well phenotyped so you have an idea of what you want to look at, what the pathophysiology might be, then you can use some of these approaches, either a candidate gene if you've got something in mind, or um, a genome-wide association study, or whole genome sequencing. Those things can be done to try, to try to figure out what the genetic basis is for that. And then once you've got that, it's nice, then you can go back and through and test the herds figure out what your carrier rate is, see who you want to eliminate, and, uh, and it can be a very useful sample. One other thing I'll say just before I conclude is genetic tests are not always predictive of the phenotype, and that's been one of the things that's very difficult for a lot of horse owners to understand. We were very excited to find the GYS1 mutation that causes tying up in uh, quarter horses, the quarter horse breed now has a genetic panel, five different genetic mutations on a panel they use for all of the horses that are used as stallions for breeding. And many, many owners get upset and call me because their horse will test positive, but they have not seen any evidence of assertion or rhabdomyolysis. It makes them eight or ninefold more likely to develop tying up, but every horse with that specific genotype doesn't necessarily develop the disease. And that's true of almost every genetic mutation. You'll have a wide variety of uh, severities of clinical signs with the same 
genetic mutation, in part because there are many other genes that have an impact on those metabolic systems that can make it better, can make it worse. It's just um, the way the cards get shuffled and the genes that you get dealt.